That was an intense. Yeah. <laughs> the dress rehearsal went better. Okay. Okay, we're ready for you. We actually did practice this. I should have back from practice. We're ready when you are. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. So good morning and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Monica Thomasy, and I'm the National Wildlife Research Program Leader. On behalf of the Forest Service, I'd like to welcome you to this presentation titled The Science of Sagebrush Ecosystem Restoration, presented by Dr. Captain Dumro. He's a research plant physiologist at the Rocky Mountain Research Station in Boise, Idaho. This presentation is also being broadcast as a webinar by Jeannie Montblanc at the University of Nevada. Together, we are part of the Great Basin Inspired Science Exchange. I wish to thank Jeannie for offering the webinar services for this talk. Jeannie, would you like to say a few words about the webinar before I introduce the speaker? Yes, thank you so much, Monica. Um, and also, Dr. Dumrose, for allowing us to offer this presentation to a wider audience through the webinar. I want to let the webinar attendees know that if you have technical questions, you may direct them to me at any time during the webinar by typing them into the questions pane of your control panel at the top right of your screen. If you are having problems with your audio, please open your audio pane and check your audio selections. Please know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the presentation, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. A recording of this presentation will be sent to the webinar attendees through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow and will also be posted for everyone on the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange YouTube channel. One last note, there is another webinar starting at the top of the next hour, so I apologize in advance that this webinar will have to end abruptly at 1245 Eastern Time. Okay, thank you so much. All right, thanks, Jeannie. So given that slight time modification, at the end of the presentation, we'll take questions from the webinar listeners first and then people in the room. Now I'll introduce our presenters. Dr. Cass Demrose is a nursery specialist in the Forest Service's National Center for Restoration, Nurseries, and Genetic Resources, also known as RINGER. Dr. Dunrose worked 17 years as a researcher and assistant manager at the University of Idaho Research Nursery, which combined a production nursery with teaching, research, and service tenants of a land-grant university. While at Idaho, Dr. Dunrose initiated the Native Plants Journal and served as editor-in-chief for the first 15 volumes. And then he joined the Forest Service in 2001. His current work focuses on native plant propagation and deployment, assisted migration as a mitigation technique for climate change, and functional restoration. He's the author of more than 225 referee uh, research technology transfer and agricultural handbook publications. He's researched the relationship between sagebrush stock type, seeding quality, and outplanting performance. Recently, he contributed to sagebrush seeds and other plant materials section of the Department of Interior Secretarial Order 3336, which some of you might be familiar with. This is an urgent response to address the sagebrush management issues. Welcome, Cass, and thank you very much for being here today. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, everyone, for joining me. Um, feel free to move forward. I won't bite too much, and it might be easier to see the slides, because I know the Mondo screen uh, that's going to be a little bit smaller than what I was anticipating. I'm delighted to be here today to talk a little bit about the science of sagebrush ecosystem restoration. This is a huge topic. We could spend months talking on this topic, and I am not an expert in all facets of it. But uh, fortunately, I'm tall, so therefore I must be competent. I think the talk will be okay, um, particularly since uh, last night the PowerPoint period did come and visit me. We worked through some of the last detail, and I think we're all set to go. So I'm going to dive right into it since we don't have a lot of time today. Um, let's just start with where are sage grouse in the western landscape? The light green uh, areas on the, on the screen show where we think sage grouse occurred pre-European settlement, and the dark green blobs are where the current distribution of sage grouse are. Um, the Forest Service manages about 8% of the habitat across five regions. That'd be one, two, four, five, and six. Um, 
although 8% doesn't sound like a big number, that's about 9.1 million acres. And it's about the same land area that has been deemed critical habitat for the northern spotted owl, for instance. Um, and although only 8%, it does constitute 20% of the overall root reef habitat for the grouse. So we do have a significant portion um, under our land management across about 35 national forests of that land. And region four has most of the managed area. They have about 80% of that 80%, which is about 7 million acres. Um, sort of coincidentally, that range happens to coincide with where Rocky Mountain Research Station um, has its authorization to do research. And uh, as it turns out, um, we do a lot of fair bit of research with sage grouse, sage brush, and sage grouse. And if you don't know about it, the repository for Forest Service Research and Development um, publications is treesearch.ss.us. And since 2000, which is about when treesearch really came online, there's been about 120 papers either on sage brush or sage grouse. About 85% of them have been specifically on sage brush. And then, because it's in uh, Rocky Mountain Research Station's backyard, it's not surprising, uh, most of the work has been published by Rocky Mountain Research scientists although there have been important contributions from PNW and PSW as well. Within Forest Service Research and Development, there are a lot of people working on sagebrush and sagegrass issues. It's sort of a laundry list of folks. Their expertise covers a broad arena of topics. Um, if you're really interested in trying to link up your management questions or your research questions with the right folks, the best person to contact is Deborah Finch at dfinch at ss.fed.us. Um, she's sort of point person on this, and she can make the, the right connections to the right researchers um, to help you with any questions you might have. A couple of other things, just in going through some background information that I wanted to point out to you. Um, there's this really nice Sage Step uh, website, which stands for Sage Step Treatment Evaluation Project. It has a lot of resources if you're um, concerned about sage grass restoration and, and sage grass. And then two publications. Uh, that come out. Um, King Chambers is uh, one of the primary authors on these. This one, first one's got a really long title, but it's basically um, connecting strategically sage brush and sage grouse, and that's available on True Church. And then she has another publication called Field Guide for Selecting the Most Appropriate Treatments of the Sage Brush, and that's also available on True Church. So if you haven't seen those two publications, I would encourage you to go and download them and add them to your library. Cass, may I interrupt you for just a minute? Sure. I've, had, I've had a couple requests um, to ask if you could stand a little bit closer to the, the phone speaker. Oh, I'll switch sides. Okay. <laughs> I have a really short leash and not really long arms. Because <laughs> you're so tall. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> so restoration is a topic. You know, when you start applying it to sagebrush and sagegrass, it's a huge topic. There are many facets, and I'm not going to have time to grind through all of these today. So what I'd like to focus on is sort of going back to my expertise, which is plant materials development and deployment, and that's where I'm going to try and focus um, most of my remarks today. And in doing so, I'm going to use this, uh, at least as a starting point, use the six-step cycle that has come out through the Plant Conservation Alliance, uh, partnerships with BLM, Forest Service, and I'll, I'll I think 13 or 14 other federal agencies came up with this little um, circular pathway to getting plant materials back on the site. We go through seed collection, to evaluation, and development, to field establishment, to seed production, to seed storage, and finally getting those plants back um, out on restoration sites. Where in theory, then they could be seed uh, collected off and getting all of those plants again, and the cycle could repeat itself. This topic is even too big for the 20 minutes that Monica has given me. So I'm going to uh, pull it down a little bit more and make a couple of little detours. And these two detours are where I'm going to spend the rest of my time. So the first detour comes right to seed collection, where we're talking about what plant materials are we going to collect seeds from in order to do our restoration work. And I'm going to focus a lot on forbs for, and in case I didn't mention it, forbs. And then I'm going to take another little detour between seed stores and producing uh, the plant materials that we need to put out on, on the restoration site and talk a little bit about perhaps some alternative complementary plant production practices that might help us get better efficiency out of our seeds 
might include health plans and seed links, and it might help us respond to your changes in climate. So that's where we're heading now. We're going to jump right into forests. In preparing for this, I came across a couple of different strategies for incorporating forests into sagebrush ecosystems and the importance of them. And there's uh, basically two areas where they really come to the forefront. One is conservation management, where we want to maintain our forests and our grasses in our sagebrush community through proper grazing management. And I've heard this now um, a couple of times out of some ranchers from Oregon who say what's good for the bird is good for the herd. They recognize that if they can maintain high quality sagebrush communities, not only is that good for sagebrush, it's good for their economics as well. And then the second aspect is with fire prevention, where if we have um, healthy sagebrush with a good understory of forests and, and grasses, um, we can change the fire dynamics. We can reduce our fuel loads compared to invasive annual grasses. And that's also better for sagebrush and sage grass. And then tying um, some other things together here, we have the Presidential Pollinator Memo that came out last year. And USDA and the Department of Interior spent a lot of time working on the response to that presidential memo on how we uh, ensure the health of our native pollinators, including uh, monarch butterflies. And what that's really going to boil down to when we get to the conclusion is that we need more habitat for pollinators. That means we need more forbs, we need more flowers to give them the pollen and the nectar that they need. And uh, we have to look at having that available from the earliest spring dates to the latest fall dates. Um, with a diversity of plants. And like I said, attached with that is monarch conservation strategies as well. That has become a big issue. Um, fortunately, what we do for pollinators should help with the fact that monarchs feel. It just seems to me that we have an opportunity here to link sage brush restoration with sage drought restoration with pollinator health with monarch butterfly. And uh, I think if we're clever enough to, to join all of those, link all of those things together, uh, we might have better success on the landscape. A lot of hot button issues all coming back to the same group of things for us. Within the sagebrush biome, we have incredible uh, biodiversity. There's more than 5,000 different plant taxa in the sagebrush biome. Um, the center of diversity for many species. A lot of these are narrow or really endemic. Uh, we're still finding new ones. Uh, we found this bottom one here, this formation was reported in 2010. Um, in addition to the plant diversity, there's also more than 200 species of birds that reside in the sagebrush biome. Um, some endemics like uh, chicken rabbit and sage wolf. And on just one plot in Region 4 in Red Mountain, um, in a very cursory examination, some researchers there found more than a thousand species of insects just on one plot. So here's the biodiversity. These forests are important to sage grouse both directly and indirectly. Directly they are important to sage grouse because sage grouse eat them. Um, between uh, one fifth and a half of the diet by the way of pre nesting hens right before they lay their eggs is forest. They're eating a lot of work. They have a, a high vegetarian diet, if you will. And then once those eggs pass, the chicks are consuming 34 different genera of forms. That's not species, that's genera. So within those genera, it could be multiple species, and I haven't really played through this to see what the, the big number is, but it's going to be large, I'm sure. Just to give you a feel for how that looks, um, in the first three to four weeks, chicks are feeding on both annuals and perennials. Here's just a partial list of some of the species that they're, they're eating, digesting. And then after that, they switch over. They, uh, they change their palate to a different swing plant. And they use those for another month to six weeks, maybe two months. And our very same plants that are in common between the two lists. There's a few stragglers, a few pines that are in both lists. But otherwise, the palate really changes to a, a completely different swing plant. And so if we're planting five or eight or ten species of forbs, and hoping that we're doing sage grass restoration, um, we're not really giving these chicks the full smorgasbord that uh, they would really prefer to have. In addition to being eaten directly, these forbs also provide a direct, indirect support to uh, sage grass chicks, and that um, thing eats forbs, and then the sage grass chicks eat those things. 
So there's a diverse, huge diverse invertebrate community that feeds upon the forest. They're a protein rich source that birds need as they're uh, maturing. And these chicks are consuming 21 different families of invertebrates. But some of the common things that they're eating are ants and beetles, grasshoppers, caterpillars. And that last one, caterpillars, uh, seems to be a really critical one for stage grouse development. Um, this work by Craig and Crawford found in looking at a whole range of variables that the only one that they could consistently and positively show had an impact on root survival was the availability of butterfly and moth larva. And as it turns out, um, some of the other woody plants that we find in the sagebrush biome, um, air canarias and um, rubber rabbit brush, for instance, oftentimes yield more caterpillars than uh, a stand of sagebrush. So when we're thinking about specifically putting in restoration for sage grouse, we might be thinking about um, other woody plants only in addition to the sage brush. Now there are challenges with forests. Um, we know they're really important, but we also know that we have a limited number of species that are commercially available. And I think part of our default strategy here is that we, we tend to grow the ones that are easiest to grow. And that makes sense when you're starting out with something you go with what has success. But we have a lot of species that present challenges to us in plant production that we're going to have to uh, perhaps work on. And because of that, we also have a limited seed supply. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover. We have a limited seed supply. And because of that, uh, that tends to make our forest seeds a lot more expensive than native grasses or uh, some of the introduced species. And so that becomes a bottleneck too. So because I'm a nursery guy, um, I like to play with the seed supply numbers. I have a little um, example here that shows how we might be able to do something with limited seed supply. So this is an example with Monroe's uh, globe now. And I was just playing around here. This is a direct seeding example. And what if we just outplanted seedlings? I know seedlings are expensive, but bear with me. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So let's say we have 40 hectares that we wanted to do restoration on. Using uh, the generally accepted numbers for putting the nose globe now on a restoration site, I calculated we need 44 million seeds, which is about 300 kilograms, and the only price of $67 a kilogram is about $12,000 about 675 pounds, a lot of mineral growth seeds. If we were going to just plant it, those seedlings in the nursery just plant it, and to get an acceptable density on the landscape, uh, my sources told me that we need about um, a thousand plants per hectare surviving. Going through the calculation, it's down to two kilograms versus 300 kilograms, um, a lot of lower seed cost. And then the beauty of it is, We've saved enough seeds to grow another 14 million plants. Well, what can we do with those extra 14 million plants? Well, we could plant a lot bigger area um, to Monroe's world now. So our little hypothetical site here in southwestern Idaho, there's 40 acres. Can you see it up there in the upper left corner? And then um, 7,000 seeds. <coughs> so in some cases, we don't have enough seed. But if we think about it perhaps from a different angle, maybe we have sufficient seed, we just need to figure out the best way to get those seeds to be um, turned into plants on the landscape. We know that we have some challenges with uh, restoration. And so maybe this time to talk a little bit about alternative complementary methods for establishing plants. In other words, don't put all your seeds off eggs in one basket. Um, this is a paper by Knudsen et al. that just came out last year that looked at aerial seeding and, um, and drilling as well. And, Showing that we're not getting the results that we really want or expect on lower elevation dry areas. And I think part of that might be the way um, we're putting these seeds in the ground. This is a um, conventional killing um, and drilling where uh, we're dragging that piece of equipment along. You can see that there's quite a bit of soil destruction. <coughs> we have some data now that shows that when you do that sort of tillage and uh, in direct seeding and disturb the ground, you get a lot of loss of soil moisture from the upper profile of the soil. Um, in this example, this sort of yellowishy, mustardy, green line is where the soil was um, direct seeded, sort of the conventional tilling method. And then the green line is no till at all. In fact, um, this wasn't even seeded, but it was um, uh, planted to save for for the screen. And what I want to point out here is that um, the day of treatment, which is 10 marks, it takes 125 days or four months for the soil moisture in the no till area to drop down to what it is in the till conventional seeded area. 
So that's four months of um, additional moisture that you have available for your plants to get established and your plants to grow. And it really does translate into more plants on the ground. This is some data from Ott and Shaw. Um, in fact, I think these plots are right adjacent to where the measurements were taken. And then the sagebrush and where they did minimum till or no till seeding versus their conventional tilling. Um, the minimal till, which had less soil disturbance, saved more soil moisture in the and you get more than twice as many sagebrush established. So maybe thinking about site prep, uh, the way we approach getting those seeds into the ground would have um, some ramifications as well. So that takes us to the probably the least soil disturbance that just needs to do some hand planting. Um, this paper by Zetweil Robinson that came out in 2013 talks about that. And on sites where, um, especially on sites where we know that we've had poor um, performance in the past with aerial seeding, uh, they estimate that you could probably plant 100 sage brush on that site for the same amount that you're spending in aerial seed. And oftentimes, if you don't get that aerial seed, you're repeating that process over a couple of different attempts. And so, planting might actually be more cost effective. The crux of outplanting seedlings is that it all boils back to survival. Because survival is what really drives the cost of your plant. Um, if you plant out low quality poor stock and they all die, it's very expensive. If you put out high quality stock and they all survive, that helps reduce your, your uh, survival seedling cost. And this is just an example again from the Bedweiler Robinson paper. They had three different stock types. Bare room, a little 66 milliliter container. These are really tiny. They're like a half inch in diameter. Six inches long, and then a 164 milliliter container that was in the uh, person's pocket. And you can see that I think this was for 14 to 15 years. They had um, a range of survival based on those stock types. And as survival goes down, price goes up. The interesting thing is that if you combine that though with good soil moisture management, uh, which is occurred in the bottom of that, which is the data that goes with the soil moisture data, we can see that if we have really um, minimal impact on the soil surface, so that we don't lose our soil moisture. A really small container does just as well as a really large container. And so, in fact, you can reduce your planting costs just by going with smaller material if you don't disturb the soil surface. At least that's what it's suggesting to me. But you see that if you do some tillage or or do some drilling, can I go back? Yeah, page back. No. <laughs> Oh. Yay! <laughs> if, uh, if you use the disturbance and you do lose the soil moisture, then a larger stock type can help you. So this takes me to um, a process that we've been using in reforestation for about 20 years. And it's called the, oh, before I do that, I want to mention this to you. In the bottom left corner here, um, one other thing that we could use to help reduce our planting costs is just looking at some novel pieces of equipment. And this is a picture from um, our Forest Service Nursery and Boise Lucky Peak Nursery. And this is a, a sagebrush transplanter that was developed by um, our technology development center in the Forest Service. We have two, one in Missoula and one in San Diego. And they designed this to be pulled behind a four wheeler, which would be less expensive to operate than a full blown big track and um, might be more portable and might be effective. And, and getting those plants in the ground is a more efficient method to develop. So going back to the container business though, between high quality seedlings and low quality seedlings, in reforestation we've been using something called the target, seed, target plant concept for a long time. And basically um, we have six or eight, depending on who's talking about it, factors that we incorporate into what that um, plant material should look like going on with the planting site. And this plant material, even though it's a target plant concept, it could be seeds, it could be seedlings, it could be bare roots or containers. It could be rhizomes or other weird propagule, but it's trying to identify the correct material to put on the site and the correct way to grow it so it has the best physiology and morphology to survive on the site. But the overall objective of improving plant material quality and its effectiveness once deployed. So this is something we've been doing in reforestation for a long time. I don't think we've really pushed it like we could um, to the production of forbs and say. We also have a lot of manuals out there on how to grow native plants. Um, this is just one. And then within the Forest Service, we have several groups that can help with native plant production, including the National Center for Reforestation, Nursery and Genetic Resources, and the Vineyard Team. 
uh, National Sea Lab. The University of Idaho has a really strong nursery program. And then we also have in state by the forestry, we have the Western Nursery Special thing and how you can go to nurseries that you might be involved with to help them work to improve their planting stock and increase survival. And then myself as the National Nursery Special. How might we apply that on the landscape? That is planting seedlings on the landscape. Well, here's just a couple of um, ideas that I had in uh, preparing for this. If we have some areas of high quality sagebrush and they're separated somehow by um, either uh, an area that's restored with non natives or perhaps only with native grass or doesn't have the biodiversity that we need, we can plant uh, bridges across, corners across the facility, so moving the sagebrush and pollinators. And if we have an otherwise um, successful restoration where we just have low species diversity in it, we can go in and we can plant islands or clumps of native plants, either a single species or multiple species in each of these uh, clumps, in order to augment diversity. So this would be an area where we could do a little planting and really get a uh, big thing for our crop because we could get the nursery efficiency of the seed. And then over all of that, we have to have at least have in our back pocket um, some sense that we have to start thinking about climate change and what that offers us in the future. Um, we know for certain that if you don't get the right plant material onto the correct site, that is if you don't match your genetics with your outplanting site, your uh, restoration efforts are prone to failure. Um, we now have these uh, provisional seed zones that have come out last year with uh, Andy Bauer and, and a, a crew of folks from Region 6 of the Pacific Northwest um, have come out with these provisional seed zones that would work for all of our native species because for most of them we don't have the real detailed uh, seed transfer guidelines that we want. But this will work as a starting point. And then with that, uh, we have to start thinking about future climate. And this is some work from um, uh, Bryce Richardson in the Rocky Mountain Station looking at biosomatic modeling of Wyoming big sagebrush. And in this example, yellow is where the range of Wyoming big sagebrush is expected to contract. Rays where it's supposed to be stable, and blue is the areas where we expect it to expand under the climate of uh, 2060. So we can start to use that tool to increase our success by knowing where to target our, our restoration efforts. And of course, this all depends on microsite and lots of other factors, but it provides a, a roadmap for where we might want to go. And then on top of that, we can start talking about assisted migration and dynamic use of seed zones where maybe we need to do some assisted population migration where probably um, big cities from yellow needs to start transitioning to gray, um, or maybe some assisted range expansion where it needs to transition from gray into, into blue zones. So that we can help uh, these plants move across the landscape in response to climate. So to uh, summarize this whirlwind tour, um, can we kill six birds as long as we not take grouse with one stone? And if the answer is yes, we can do that if we focus on annual and perennial forests. Um, we know the benefits of these forests in uh, providing resilience and resistance to invasive species spread, um, change in fire dynamics, and broader diversity will help us uh, mitigate changes in the climate. These forests are also directly supporting sage droughts by providing them food. They're indirectly supporting sage droughts by providing them um, substrate for the invertebrate seeds, which the same job can do. And then we have a couple of other win-win wins we can get with this. We can also support uh, we can also support pollinators. <coughs> I'm going the wrong way. Hang up there, folks. We can also support pollinators and uh, start to meet the goals of the Department of Agriculture, Department of the Interior um, requirements that are coming out. We can support monarch butterflies just by adding a few fluffiest into the mixes. And then we can also support, um, on a broader scale, um, the complex biodiversity that we see in the sagebrush bio, um, including pronghorn and mule deer and lizards and uh, the other things that go along with pollinators, um, sage grouse and the 200 species of birds and Indian rabbits and whatnot. So my technical message today is let's focus on the forest. And with that, now I think I'm finally ready to go to that slide. Um, my email address is at the bottom if you'd like to um, 
to contact me or if you want a copy of this uh, presentation. And you might want a copy because I've included all the references and it's a really key tiny font that you won't have time to uh, write down. But if you'd like this list, um, just give me a holler at that email address. And so with that, in the last uh, seven minutes we have, let's uh, open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Kathy. That's great. Um, so since the webinar portion is over a quarter of, we'll take questions from folks on the phone first and then the room afterwards. Go ahead, Jeannie. Okay, great. Um, I, I didn't know if we'd have time for the webinar folks to ask questions. So we have 52 attendees. So if any of you have a question for Dr. Dumrose, please open your questions pane in your control panel and type your question and I will field it um, to Dr. Dumrose. Um, so you might want to take a question from the audience while um, I wait okay. for questions to come in. All right. Ken, um, how would you, you know, when I see that map of the uh, sea transfer zones, I see how beautiful it is, <laughs> and then you would see, how would you recommend we approach getting that same sort of information for the rest of the country? Oh, so the question is, looking at the provisional sea zone map, the eastern and the midwestern United States looks nice and orderly and simple, and then you have chaos in the west. Well, the reason we have all that chaos in the west is because we start to include other variables like elevation and aspect come into play. Mm -hmm. And so actually that's good data for the Midwest and the East. Those are sound provisional sea transfer zones. It's just that things are more complicated in the West. So really? I mean it's that simple in the East and that complicated. I mean that we I have one of the co-authors on the paper here. So right. that is correct. I'm, I'm not, but that we're in East. But, um, so those are just the climate data that you, you were showing. Uh, we also recommend that they be superimposed with the only level three ecoregions, which helps subdivide it even further and, yeah. and sets it up to be more manageable. So in the West, the, yeah, in the West, the level three ecoregions give you a, a little bit easier way of, of uh, fighting off the transfers on the network. Okay. Maybe we can, yeah. But we might be able to apply some of those things. I have a question about um, establishing the, the unit because you're talking about establishing. It seems like you have a problem with convergence where you created this attractive oasis and many species come and graze there or take from it and you end up not having it for very long. Do you have to do you have a strategy for putting things in place and maybe, you know, fencing off part of it or protecting more of it so that you don't get this kind of overuse of these can we get to that in a second? Because um, I have another slide, but I think just in the interest of time, let's see if there's any questions from the webinar folks, and then I'll, I'll come back to that. There are not. There are oh. none? Um, actually, uh, well, I, I, somebody has a question, but uh, Lori Kurth has a question, but she hasn't typed it in yet. So let me have her finish typing it in. So I can it. <laughs> okay. So go ahead. The, the question that came from from the audience here in, in the East building was: um, so you put all all of these forbs out onto the landscape, and especially if you're planting them, do you have to worry about browse and uh, and it would be herbivory be a problem? Okay. Um, the other thing, like, from what I've done on my own property, looking at police prairie restoration, is that um, generally these the forms that we're using, our native forms, are extremely resilient to herbivory, and I don't think it would be a problem. I think our biggest problem is seeing the forms established on the ground. If we can get survival, I think we've, we've gotten over the uh, we've gotten over the fence, and we should be fine. But you don't see that as an issue in establishment because I, I just, I don't. you know, so, so you, if you can get them, you're really, your limiting factors are what come out of water, water. just to make them in baby to my baby mistakes. So it's not really grazing with an issue. I don't think grazing would be an issue. We're really in water, um, we have really water deficient system. Mm -hmm. And so getting things to grow that first year, maybe it's the first winter when we get the bulk of our moisture, that's probably more critical, I think, than and browse. Now with weeds, you know, I've seen some problems with weeds, say first being decimated by things that, that gnaw. Um, but for the forest, I don't think it would be an issue. Okay, I have a question now from the webinar. I'm sorry, were you were you done? 
I'm done. Okay, Lori Kurth asked, can you explain restoration with non-native species? Is it restoring some function, but not necessarily eco uh, the ecosystem function for the native ecosystem components? Well, it depends on how you want to define restoration today. Um, we've got a lot of different definitions of restoration. So if restoration in your um, definition means not being annual invasive grasses, then um, putting in a non-native perennial grass would be a type of restoration. And in the field of restoration, it's not unheard of to start, especially with um, a very degraded system where you're almost really starting with a reclamation activity, of starting with a non-native species that you can use to occupy the site until you can um, progressively start to reintroduce your native species. So using a non-native to replace an even worse non-native would be reclamation, so therefore it would be restoration, at least the way I would look at it. Okay. So that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Lori said thanks. That's very helpful as there are many definitions of restoration. <laughs> um, if she really wants to, to get her eyes to glaze over looking at different uh, definitions of restoration, including functional restoration, I'll plug myself. Um, I just co-authored a paper with John Stanter that was published last year in Forest Ecology and Management. And we go through a lot of these definitions, um, defining the R words. And, um, <laughs> the I think that's a really important question for sage grouse conservation, though, because they, you know, what, what exactly is sage grouse habitat restoration? And that, I don't think we've actually defined that yet. Yeah. I don't think we have, and we're not going to in the next 30 seconds. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we probably only have one uh, time for one more webinar. I mean, yeah, webinar question. So uh, it's from Dale Stewart, and he asks: In doing forest restoration work, we generally have better access to planting units than the open range where you advocate planting. Doesn't that drive costs through the roof? Yeah. Um, anytime you have to travel a long distance to do any work, that's going to increase your cost. Um, one thing I did mention, but I, I would like to do it before the webinar people disappear, is that you know, I think we should be focusing our sage grouse restoration activities um, next to our existing best sage grouse habitat. Because we don't want to lose any more sage grouse habitat. So if we can focus our efforts adjacent to what is really good sage grouse habitat now, put our resources there, uh, then we can preserve and protect what we already have. Because we don't want to lose that. And then we can work sequentially away from that. Um, I'm not sure if that helps with that question, but I think that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, great. Thank you so much um, for doing this webinar for us, and we're going to have to close out the webinar now, but I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Jeannie, and thanks to the Great Basin Fire Science Project. Great. Okay. See you later. Thanks. Bye-bye.